Welcome to this new series of Linus Past and Present. None of this material appears in the A to Z series. We start with Andy's at the Royal Mail line, initially in her black livery. Andy's is seen in Southampton behind Astorius. And then we see her in the Norwegian fjords. In 1959, she was rebuilt as a cruise liner and painted white. We now see her cruising in the Caribbean. Our next ship is the p Arcadia, built in 1953. Her main job was as a mail ship carrying passengers to Australia and the Far East. We see her here on a Mediterranean cruise. A short clip of the Atlantica. We go back to Piano now with the cruise ship Aurora. She's seen here berthed in Southampton in 2011. We see Aurora tied up in Southampton, about to leave. You can contrast her with the much bigger Independence of the Seas, which sailed the following day. We'll see that later.
Aurora glides down Southampton water on her way to the open seas. We see here Fred Olsen's Balmoral tied up in Rouen on a short cruise in 2010. She had previously seen service as Norwegian Crown and Crown Odyssey before being purchased by Fred Olsen and stretched. Another Fred Olsen cruise ship, Black Watch, passes Braemar on her way back to Southampton from a cruise to the Canaries. As she draws closer, Braemar will give her three blasts on her sirens to be answered by Black Watch and a lot of hand waving from the bridge.
And here is Braemar on a cruise to Guernsey and Honfleur. We see her here in Guernsey. Braemar was stretched in 2009. She's a lovely looking ship now, and despite her small size, her top deck has one of the largest open areas I've seen on any cruise ship. Here we see her tied up in Enfleur. We see her again, this time on a cruise to the Mediterranean. These pictures were taken in Cartagena. And we leave Braemar bunkering in Lisbon. Two short clips of the liner Bremen at sea. And now some more pictures of Canberra. Here we see the stern of Canberra tied up in Naples. And then some more rather grainy shots of Canberra in the Mediterranean. The last shot shows her coming in to Southampton. From the bow of Canberra, we see Cape Town Castle in Southampton. And here is a distant shot of her at sea. <clears throat> Chitral is seen in the twilight off the Isle of Wight.
yet another piano liner, this time the Chosan. After the merger with the Orient line, the Pierno painted the boot topping of all their ships green. But this only lasted for a few years and they reverted to the usual red rust colour. Take no notice of the board saying Andes, this is the Colombi. Whilst on a cruise to Honfleur in Braemar, we saw Discovery coming down the Seine from Rouen. Discovery started life as the Island Venture in 1972 and this was then changed to Island Princess in 1999. She was one of the two love boats so popular on American television. Now we see Discovery tied up in Scrapster, near Dunnet Head in Scotland. Here she is on the Silver Seas, passing Dunnet Head. She passes the lighthouse and coast guard cottages at Dunnet Head.
a short clip of the Giulio Cesare, Julius Caesar. Regrettably, these are very grainy pictures. A couple of clips of the Swedish ship Gripsholm. Tiny ship in a wide ocean, Hebridean princess, seen passing down its head. Later on, she tied up at Scrapster for the day. We move on to Pierno's Himalaya. She's seen here burst in Colombo Harbour. Another P&O post-war ship, the Iberia, seen here on a Mediterranean cruise. Seen here in Southampton, the massive independence of the seas, a Royal Caribbean cruise liner. At the time of making this film, the independence of the seas was the third largest cruise liner in the world. As she moved down Southampton water towards the open seas, I found it very difficult to get the whole ship in the frame of my camera lens. At last she moved far enough away for me to get the whole ship into the picture.
Contrast the independence of the seas with the majestic, just a third of her size. The majestic is seen here coming into Southampton. She operated for the White Star Line on the North Atlantic run. We first see the 1938 Mauritania in the black and white colours of Cunard for their North Atlantic run. Later on she was painted in the cruise colours of light green and a slightly darker green for cruising. We can watch her here as she steams out of Naples. Two ships of the Micao Kalalin class. It's very difficult to tell them apart. A few short clips of the Normandy as she entered New York on her maiden voyage. A very short clip of the Shaw Savile Liner Northern Star. When talking about Balmoral, I mentioned Norwegian Crown earlier. These pictures were taken on a round South America cruise in 2000. If you compare Norwegian crown with Balmoral as she is now, I think you'll find that stretching did her a power of good. Orford was one of the five 20,000 tonners built for the Orient Line in the 1920s. She's seen here in black and white cruising in the Mediterranean. Before the war there was no depth finding equipment, so we see a sailor here using the traditional method of swinging the lead. Passengers waiting to go ashore as a sea plane passes overhead. Whilst the passengers are ashore, the crew take the opportunity to exercise the ship's boats. It's interesting to note the officer's dress code. He's wearing a blue reefer jacket with white trousers, not a rig used after the war. Well, not by the Orient Line, although I know the Union Castle Line still used that sort of uniform from time to time.
The Staff Commander, the second in command, with the Chief Officer in conversation on the boat deck. We now move on to the Orion. Orion had many innovations, particularly for the Orient Line, just one mast and one funnel. This time it's the turn of the passengers to undertake lifeboat instructions. It's interesting that nowadays these instructions are taken before the ship leaves the first port, but then it was quite often done later in the day or the day after. The motorboat is lowered to take passengers ashore in Venice. The staff commander is on the bridge during a bridge visit. Bridge visits were always a part of the cruise, but nowadays they very rarely happen because of increased security. Now we are post-war again and the film is in colour and we see the Oranze, pictures taken from the Andes when they were both in harbour together. A familiar scene, here we see Oranze in Malta on another cruise. After the merger and by 1967, all the Orient Line ships had been painted white. But as you can see in this picture, she retains her green boot topping. This lasted for a year or two more before they were all painted in the piano red rust color. We get a good aerial view of Oranze in Barcelona. A 
And now we revert to another 20,000 tonner, the Orontes. She's seen here on a Mediterranean cruise. A short clip in colour. Until quite recently I didn't have very much good footage of Orsova, but this has come in recently and I'm very happy to share it with you. Orsova also had some new innovations. She had no mast for a start and she was all welded, not riveted. Another of Orient Liner's 20,000 tonners, a Tranto, seen here on a cruise to Norway. And she's pictured here coming into Port Side. The final pictures are in colour and were taken after the war. Unfortunately, these pictures of Pendennis Castle are rather dark, but you still get a good view of the ship as she passes another Union Castle liner on her way to or from Cape Town. Some rather grainy pictures of the first Queen Elizabeth before her launch. We next see her in Southampton in the 1950s.
and a final shot of her sailing down the Solent. Some early pictures of QE2 when she still had a white funnel. And then we can move on to the new Queen Elizabeth. She's seen here entering Fremantle. The ship on the left of your picture is a container vessel. We leave the Queen Elizabeth tied up in Fremantle, just ahead of Pino's Aurora. This ship was launched originally as the Malolo, but in 1937 was renamed Matsonia. Again in 1949 she was renamed Atlantic, and finally in 1954 Queen Frederica. Another shot from the overhead cable car in Barcelona.
Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, but I think that the Queen Mary was the most beautiful ship ever built. Here we can watch her leaving New York. There was a lot more of this sequence, but unfortunately the film was damaged and it jumped all over the place, so I couldn't include it. These ships of the Chandras line were very popular with British tourists and cruisers in the 1970s. The Reina del Mar had joined the Reina del Pacifico to run on the South America run for Pacific steam navigation. When this became unprofitable, she was chartered to the Royal Mail line, eventually painted in her colours and cruised for a number of years for them. She became a very popular cruise ship. We come to the Santa Maria. In January 1961, during a voyage from Curacao to Miami, she was taken over by a group of armed rebels opposed to the Portuguese head of state Salazar. She headed for Angola. After long negotiations, she changed course for Recife where the passengers were unloaded and eventually the rebels surrendered. We go up north again to Dunnet Head where we can see Silver Cloud cruising between the Scottish mainland and Orkney. Holland America's Staten Dam, seen here in the Mediterranean.
Strathmore was built by Vickers Armstrong alongside Orion. They shared many of the same features and good looks. Strathmore was used almost exclusively on voyages to and from Australia and for cruising during the summer. Towards the end of her career she did a lot of cruising. Transvaal Castle, which later became the Baal, is seen here in Cape Town in her Union Castle colours. A little black and white footage of the liner United States which took the blue ribbon for the Atlantic crossing from the Queen Mary in 1952. Finally, we see the United States tied up in Southampton. The Union Castle liner Windsor Castle, seen here in Cape Town and filmed on the same day as the earlier film of Transvaal Castle.